So now that we know a little bit more about weak acids and bases and how they dissociate, which is obviously less than 100%, and by less than 100% we don't mean 99 or 95 or even 50%. We're talking very small amounts, maybe in the single digits to very low double digits of ionization. If you get an acid that dissociates between 5 and 12%, let's say, that's actually a pretty significant amount of dissociation for a weak acid. And so you would obviously see the difference between having 100% for a strong acid or base versus, you know, a 5 to 12% uh, dissociation for a weak acid or base. So this is a graph that we've seen before where HF, um, which we're using as our example of a weak acid or base and a weak electrolyte, ionizing to form some H plus and some F minus. And we can see that the majority of the solution remains in the unionized state. Now, what affects pH? Remember, the lower the pH, the stronger the acid. So in order to get a very low pH and have a very strong acid, you need out of all of these three, out of HF, H, and F, what you need is H+. Plus. This is what you need. You need an H plus concentration that is high. The higher the H plus concentration, the lower the pH and the stronger the acid. So the level of this ionization, how much of this HF is going to become H plus, meaning what percent or what concentration of molarity will we receive of this H plus after the dissociation of this weak acid. That is what's going to determine just how strong an acid this is. And we do have a particular value that will give us an indication. It is an indirect indication of how strong or weak an acid or base is. And for an acid we call that a Ka, the dissociation constant. The higher the Ka, the more this HF dissociates to form H+. So the higher the Ka, the higher the H+, the higher the H+, plus, the stronger the acid, the lower the pH. And the same is true for a base. A base will have the same principle applied, except what we will look for is a pH that is high. The higher the pH, the stronger the base. We only get that when our H minus, OH minus concentration is high. And how much of this OH minus we get after dissociation depends on the dissociation constant for the base. We call that the KV. Higher the KV, just like the Ka, the more we will get some dissociation of our base. The more base dissociates, the more hydroxide we get, the higher the pH and the stronger the base. So we need to use Ka's and KV's to help us find pH. Without them, it's a lost cause. So let's take a look here and see how we can solve these two problems. We've got uh, one using a weak acid and one using a weak base, just for good measure. And the principle that we use here is the ice box method. So if you're not familiar with the ice box method, it's basically a tabular way of keeping track of the concentration of your weak acid or base and the ion that it produces. If it's a weak acid, it will produce H plus and a conjugate base, in this case the F minus, and vice versa for a base. It will produce a hydroxide ion and a conjugate acid. And so this is a very nice way of keeping up with our concentrations and therefore being able to solve for either H plus or OH minus concentrations. Because eventually our goal is to find either H plus or OH and plug into the pH or pOH equations. So let's go ahead and write our equation, which is what I recommend everyone do as their first step. HF will dissociate into H plus and F minus, of course. That being said, let's see how much we have. Ice box. So I stands for initial, C stands, stands for the change, and E is the equilibrium concentration. So 
how much initially do we have of this HF? How much does it change and therefore how much is left over at equilibrium? How much is this right here? More importantly, how much initially do we have of the hyd hydrogen ion? How much does that concentration change and how much is there is left at equilibrium? Meaning how much is this value? So let's take a look and see uh, what information we're given in the problem. What is the pH of a 0.25 molar HF solution? So the initial concentration of course then is 0.25 of our hydrofluoric acid. Initially we have no hydrogen ion and no fluoride ion. From this information we need to then find the pH. So how do we go about doing that? Well what change we do know it's good, that's going to happen is that we're going to lose some of this HF. Some of it will get converted to H plus and F minus. We just don't know what that amount is going to be. So we're going to call that our unknown or X. But at least we know that it's a minus X for the reactants because we're losing some of this HF. What we lose in the reactants, of course, we gain in the product. So we will gain the X as H plus and we'll gain the X as F minus. 1x because we have 1h, 1x because we have 1f. Had this been a 2h or 2f, of course, this would have been a 2x as well. So stoichiometrically, they do stay proportional. In this case, though, we had just one of each, and that is x. So at the end, at equilibrium, how much of hf do we have left? Well, we have 0.25, which we began with, and we lost x. So we should have 0.25 minus x remaining. All right, and how much do we have of H plus at equilibrium? Zero plus X is X. And for fluor uh, the fluoride ion, zero plus X is X. All right, so that's good. We've got some information there then that we can now use. Of course, what is our goal? Our end goal is always going to be for pH, pOH equations to solve for X. X is going to be H plus, X is going to be OH minus, and so that is essentially what we're going to need in order to plug into one of our equations, the pH or the pOH equations. So, let's get rid of this here. And set up our problem. So, we have the majority of the problem set up, but we're going to need one more piece of information, and that is, of course, the K value, because the K is going to tell us just exactly how much H plus we have. We can't solve th w uh, for this variable without having it equal something, right? In algebra, it's always X equals something. So what does all of this equal? Well, if you recall, K whatever the K may be, KA, KB, KEQ, K is always products over reactants. In this case it's a KA value equal to the product concentrations H plus and F minus over reactant concentrations, in this case HF. You will have to either be given the, a, the KA value or you will have to look it up in a reference table. All right, so we happen to know by looking up the Ka value for hydrofluoric acid that it is 7.1 times 10 to the negative 4. All right, so let's solve for X. Ka equals hydrogen is X, so we'll plug in X for that. Fluoride ion is X, so let's plug in for that. We'll substitute in those variables. HF is 0.25 minus X, 0.25 minus X, and all that should equal 7.1 times 10 to the negative 4. So let's simplify this a little bit. This will become X squared over 0.25 minus X equals 7.1 times 10 to the negative 4. Now, at this point, you should recognize this as a big, bad polynomial. The good news is that you don't necessarily have to factor this out and use the quadratic equation, which would be a squared value, the x squared, one x value, and an integer. So it's the x squared 
plus x or minus x plus the integer value, a squared plus b plus c. So when can we do this? When will we have a high enough concentration? So you have to make sure you understand the assumption method. If you have an ionization value that is less than 5% ionization, the assumption method is okay. You do not have to use the quadratic formula and that is great. What this assumption method says is that this x value, the amount of hydrogen ion that is actually dissociating is so minuscule compared to this 0.25 that 0.25 minus this tiny amount will probably be a number that's pretty much 0.25. So why not just assume x to be so small that it's negligible, meaning that we can eliminate it altogether. What about x up here? Well, compared to nothing, no matter what the value of x is, it's going to be significant. So we're going to keep it up here. But down here, when we're subtracting it from 0.25 or any other what, would, what we would consider high concentrations, we certainly would consider to be insignificant and cancel it out. At this point, it's looking a lot simpler to solve for x. 0.25 times 7.1 times 10 to the negative 4 will give us 0 0.000175, and that will equal x squared. We will take the square root of this guy, and x will equal 0 0.0133. Now what is x? x is h plus. Bingo. Let's plug that into the pH is equal to the negative log of h plus concentration equation. And we can solve for pH. Finally, 0 0.0133 is the concentration that we just plug in. And we should end up with a pH value of 1.88. So now that we've attained the pH of 1.88, let's look and see if our percentage ionization is indeed less than 5%. If it is, we can stick with this value and be done with the problem. If it happens to be more than 5%, and it depends how strict you are and how sensitive your data is, even if it's more than uh, a little more than 5%, you would still have to go back and use a quadratic formula. But let's see if it's less than 5%. So the percentage ionization is equal to the amount of the acid that we ended up forming in ionized form, which is 0 0.0133 from the pH equation divide that by the original acid concentration of 0.25 and of course to get the percentage multiply by 100 and if you do that you will find that you have 5.3 percent so just shy of the cutoff point this does mean that it's greater than 5 percent the assumption method does not work and so you will have to go back to the step of x squared over 0.25 minus x equaling the Ka of hydrofluoric acid, which is this value, and you will have to factor out this times this to equal x squared, move everything to one side such that you have an a x squared plus b x plus c equals zero format. You have the square, the x, and the integer. The square, the x, and of course the integers, all equaling zero. And that you can then plug into the quadratic equation and solve. The pH value you will get, of course, will depend on what you will attain at the end of the quadratic equation calculation. It will be very close to this value. 
which means your pH will probably be very close to that value as well. So if you are just trying to make an estimate, you may not necessarily need, the, uh, uh, need to go through the quadratic equation. But if your information or your data is very sensitive, and even a hundredth of a decimal place or even less would make a significant difference, then by all means you should use the quadratic equation and therefore get a more precise and accurate hydrogen ion concentration or hydroxide should it be a base and therefore a more precise pH or POH value as well. They won't be significantly uh, or drastically different but they can uh, be different based on just how much ionization you have. The greater the ionization level, the further from 5% it is, the more you will have your ionized value here, this concentration be different, and the greater this value will be different from what you attained using the assumption method. Some students prefer just to use the quadratic equation from the get-go and save themselves some time and anxiety and just do it one way through. Others prefer to use the assumption method and check themselves, but you won't know if you need to use the quadratic equation or not until you go through this entire process, solve the problem, attain your percentage ionization, and if it's less than 5%, then you're lucky and you can move on, but if it's greater than 5%, you will ultimately have to come back to the quadratic equation.